May 1944, Allied bombers are reaching deep into Germany to attack war industries and transportation lines. Fighter aircraft of the German Luftwaffe rise to meet the bombers in furious air battles. On May 12, 1944, American 8th Air Force bombers pounded Germany's synthetic oil industry. P-47 Thunderbolts of the 56th Fighter Group applied new and aggressive tactics to destroy Germany's air defenses and to protect the Allied bomber force. May 12, 1944, a mission that changed the war. I'm Gary Sinise, and this is Missions That Changed the War. Luftwaffe Group and Commander Gunther Rohl, the third highest scoring ace in history, led his Me 109s and Focke Wolf 190s against the Allied bombers and fighters. For Rohl, it would be a fateful day. On the same day, Colonel Hubert Hub Zemke, leader of the U.S. Army Air Force's 56th Fighter Group, known as Zemke's Wolfpack, led his P 47 fighters into battle protecting the Allied bombers. He was employing a new tactic for the first time, a tactic that would shift the tides of the air war. Lieutenant Robert Shorty Rankin flew with the 56th Group that day, and in that single mission, he became a double ace, destroying five enemy aircraft. Was one of those enemy aircraft flown by Gunther Rohl? The Allied bombing raid on Germany's synthetic oil plants had devastating effects on the Nazis' ability to wage war. Without oil, Germany's armies could not move. Its planes could not fly. Zemke's new fighter tactics against the Luftwaffe gave the Allies greater control of the skies over Europe. More and more Allied bombers could reach targets deep inside Germany and return safely to England. According to Albert Speer, the Nazi Minister of Munitions, this Allied bombing raid on German oil production was a turning point in the war in Europe. Hitler's armies would fight on for 12 more months. But, said Speer, it was the day that Germany technically lost the war. World War I. When the fighting ended on the 11th of November, 1918, Nearly 10 million soldiers were dead. An estimated 13 million civilians had died as a result of the war, and millions more were displaced from their homes. The major empires of Europe had ceased to exist. The German, Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires were broken. Their far-flung colonies, and much of their European territories, divided among the victors. The Treaty of Versailles, signed in May 1919, annexed parts of Germany to Belgium, France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Italy. The treaty limited the size of Germany's army and navy, 
outlawed a German submarine fleet and prohibited Germany from maintaining an air force. Most of the fighting had taken place in Belgium and France. There, the loss of property and the economic upheaval were catastrophic. The Treaty of Versailles called for huge reparation payments from Germany. France insisted that the treaty include a war guilt clause that forced the German nation to accept full responsibility for starting the war and to assume liability for all the damages the war had caused. The crushing reparation payments shattered the fragile German economy. German marks became worthless. Personal savings were wiped out for middle-class people, and seven million Germans were left jobless. The Treaty of Versailles imposed so many cruelties on this country uh, that the outcome couldn't have been anything else but dictatorship. Uh, people were starving. The economy was down all the time because uh, the reparations that had to be paid to mainly to France and to the other uh, countries um, that had won World War I were so immense that the economy couldn't, ev economy couldn't ever recover. Uh, and if people starve, they are likely to fall prey to anybody who promises them better. And this is in simple terms the way that led to Hitler. The German people felt humiliated by the Treaty of Versailles. They were crushed by unemployment and hyperinflation. By the 1930s, political instability and economic depression left the German public disillusioned with the Weimar Republic, the democratic government set up after World War I. With keen political skill, Adolf Hitler built the Nazi Party into a mass movement that appealed to German traditions of nationalism, militarism, discipline, and the supremacy of the state over individuals. Once elected, Hitler renounced the Treaty of Versailles and began rebuilding Germany's military forces. Behind the scenes, he silenced or crushed any opposition and maneuvered himself into absolute power. He cut unemployment, and that was the most important thing everybody wanted him to do. That was why he was elected, finally. Uh, what people did not see was what happened behind the scenes. Where did all those unemployed go? They went straight into the arms industry. Uh, or they went into the uh, construction industry, uh, building highways, autobahns in Germany, which were a first-hand military infrastructure. Uh, they didn't see the, the, the unobvious. Uh, or what could be seen on the surface was, this man kept every promise he ever made. So no wonder he had been elected and re-elected again. And uh, a third ele election, in fact, didn't take place. Uh, because he just thought uh, we can go on better without uh, elections anymore. And nobody opposed, of course. Gunther Rall was born March 10, 1918, in the Black Forest village of Gaganau. His mother was a devout member of the Lutheran Church. His father was a merchant who was away from home much of the time. Like most of the German people, Rall's parents supported the Nazis' economic programs but did not join the Nazi party. Rall was just 14 years old when Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany and assumed dictatorial power. You know, I was a young guy also in those days, but I think their aim was how to, by political measures, you know, get an improvement of the whole situation, means primarily economically, politically. And no member of any other party was idolized like Hitler in his party. He was a great leader, you know? In nothing, no word against him, no critique against him. What he said, this was right. Know that. First thing uh, that was implemented by Hitler after he had taken to power was a ministry of propaganda. And under this ministry, all of the information industry had been centralized within half a year. That is, there, were, there was only one radio channel that was completely controlled by the Nazis and all of the print industry, all newspapers, all magazines were under control of a censor that sat in the Ministry of Propaganda. 
uh, it was strictly forbidden by law uh, to listen to foreign radio stations, to, to radio stations outside Germany. Uh, you could get into prison if someone uh, um, told, told the authorities that you were listening to BBC London, for example, or even to a Swiss broadcasting system. Uh, so the first thing they tried was to limit the Germans' view on the outside world and make them think in the direction the Nazi party had decided the people should think to. Uh, Hitler managed to reduce unemployment uh, within two years to less than one million. So he was cheered upon like, like uh, as if he had magical powers. And most of the people thought, ah, well, this Jewish thing is really disgusting, uh, but basically he seems to be the right man at the right place. They wanted somebody who, who recovered the economy, who brought people back to work. He did exactly that. He, he delivered on all of his promises. And most people thought, okay, once he is at, he is at power and once he, he, has a, he has to deal with these huge problems, he will forget about that Jewish thing. He did not. As a young man growing up in Austria after World War I, Gunther Rahl was an accomplished athlete in track and field events. He received a classical education in languages and science. In 1928, at age 10, Rahl joined the German Christian Scout Movement. Scouting became one of the main influences on his young life. When the Christian Scouts were absorbed into the Hitler Youth Movement in 1934, the scouts themselves saw little change. We changed the shirt. <laughs> you know, we had a grey-blue shirt as Christian uh, uh, Boy Scouts, and this, blue. When we were taken over, 1934, and we got a brown shirt and a black. We did the same as before, the same uh, romantic things. In the Weimar Republic, established in Germany after World War I, there were many political parties all fighting with each other. But there was one stable elite, the German army, the Reichswehr. Reichswehr, 100,000 men, very selective. Even this is challenging a young man, you know, uh, to become an officer. They had applications from 100 and they took two. And this gives you a a feeling you are, uh, you are, um, you have the quality. So I want to become an officer uh, to be in this area also, in this elite. And uh, then I made my, when I made my application uh, at the regiment 13, I think we had 74 applications they took four of them, and I was one of them, I was very proud of that. But this had nothing to do with the party, you know, with the political area. This was just your duty for your country. Right from the start of the so-called Weimar Rep Republic uh, that had been established after World War I in 1919 in Germany, this was a, the, the first democratic system ever we had in Germany. We had a monarchy before. Uh, for more than a thousand years and then we were a, a democratic system and this democratic system uh, had in mind to separate uh, the army from everything that had to do with politics. So they made a law, the so-called Reichswehrgesetz, uh, that, that um, uh, forbade officers to become member of a political party or even join a political movement. Political discussions within a army housing area, for example, within the troops, were forbidden. You were not allowed to discuss politics once you wore a uniform. You were not allowed to join a political party for good reasons, for good reasons. Because the, the thought behind that was an army should always be educated to defending a country and not be split up internally by political discussions between left and right and liberals and conservatives and the like. 
Rawls spent two years in the prestigious Infantry Regiment No. 13. In 1938, he requested transfer to the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, and entered the flying service. After earning his wings and promotion to lieutenant, he was assigned to JG-52, flying the Messerschmitt ME-109. I came to the wing. Uh, that time to the uh, fourth squadron, 52. And uh, when I was, I got my uh, introduction on the uh, 109E model. And it was uh, two, three, four flights, and that's it. And then you are in the, in the formation. I flew all the other ones. And I see the differences. And there are some problems in the 109, first of all, for young pilots. The undercarriage, narrow and high. And I recognized that when we trained the Romanians down, we had a lot of ground loops, you know. Uh, and then the, the, it broke, the undercarriage. Secondly, uh, you got slots in the 109. The slots um, increase the lift at low speed. But when you are up in a perk fight, rough turns, there was a chance that just by gravity, the outer slot comes out and you can snap. You have to recognize that. The 109 had a very, very tight and narrow cockpit. Uh, poor visibility to the back. The starting system with the mechanic outside, uh, eclipse starting. And uh, this was very difficult in Russia, for instance, at temperature of minus 30. We knew we have a good plane. The greatest weakness of the VF-109 was a design that uh, put production uh, ease ahead of uh, use in the field. They designed it so that the uh, fuselage was supported by the landing gear and you could attach and detach wings readily for repair and for assembly and so forth. But it gave it a very, very narrow tread and the tread was such that uh, they lost some 3,000 pilots. Uh, in landing and takeoff accidents in, in the airplane. So it, its greatest defect was its landing characteristics. In the air, it was fast. It had uh, a, a, a good roll weight, not as good as, as the FWD 109. It had a good altitude capability, not as good at diving capability, and not as good at turning capability as the Spitfire. On September 1st, 1939, Without a formal declaration of war, Germany invaded Poland. Lieutenant Gunther Rohl was in flight school at Brandenburg, learning to fly the ME-109. On September 16th, Rohl and his fellow flight students were assigned to an operational combat fighter unit. Rohl was sent to Jagdgeschwader 52, near the French-German border. He had just two months of fighter training and 55 minutes of flight time in an ME-109. The war who came was a shock for the whole nation. There wasn't hallelujah, you know, World War I. They marched and sung songs, national songs, and uh, uh, they haven't lost the war. We are just 20 years after we lost the war, the next war, this was a shock. By throughout the nation, Hitler's goal was to look east, to capture territory and resources from Poland, Russia, and the Ukraine. He didn't want or expect war with England and France, but treaties and promises to come to the aid of Poland bound those countries. So they declared war on Germany. You know, another war, this was not, this was 20 years, about uh, 21 years after last war which had a horrible consequences. So there was no enthusiasm for that. I will tell you, uh, as an officer, you have to, if a war comes, that's your duty. Throughout the winter of 1939-1940, Rawls squadron flew uneventful defense patrols along the German border. When the Nazis invaded France and Belgium on May 18, 1940, Rawl finally entered enemy airspace for the first time. On May 18th, Rawl and nine other fighters were sent to rendezvous with a reconnaissance HE-111 over France. At the rendezvous, they spotted three Curtis Hawks of the French Air Force 
moving to attack the HE-111. Rawl engaged one of the Hawks and shot it down, his first kill. Seconds later, bullets smashed into his own plane. Rawl snap rolled into a dive, leveled out on the deck, and short on fuel, headed home. And I always say this was very educational, these things. The first uh, event that I shot him down gave me the confidence, I can do it. And the second sensation that I was hit gave me a warning saying, the next time this can be you. In July, Rawls' group was stationed on the coast of France near Calais on one sortie. They were escorting a flight of Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers across the channel to England. We had to escort Ju-87 over the channel to England. Ju-87 is a very slow aircraft. A dive bomber. And if a bomb hangs on the knees, it's even slower. And we had to stay with them at the wing. And the Spitfire just upstairs waited, came down, we had a tremendous losses. And then my, my group commander was killed, and my squadron commander was killed, and so forth, in the first missions. This means that I was at the age of 22. That first battle over the channel taught Rawl a lesson in fighter tactics. His squadron had been ordered to escort the Stukas by staying in formation over the slower dive bombers. The result had been disastrous. This was very important at the British Channel. You know, you have not dictate a fighter pilot where he had to stay in an air battle. He looks looking for his uh, airspace he uses to be uh, to get a chance to be successful. He lose, he found that. You can give him an order, you say you have to protect him, okay, from there on, it's his business, where he flies, what he does, you know? And, 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 and that selection uh, qualifies his also, his, his capability. Rawls' squadron remained near Calais, France and took part in the early weeks of the Battle of Britain the air battle that Germany hoped would defeat the Royal Air Force and open the way for an invasion of the island nation. The Royal Air Force very quickly gained tremendous uh, respect from the German side. There were the tactics, how they were led from the ground, how excellent things, and uh, they had a, a good uh, tactics Good equipment, Spitfire, Hurricane. So we, that's well, I think it was the best Air Force we uh, first met. Rawl scored no victories against the British in that summer of 1940. I had Spitfires, you know where? In Russia. The Russians got Spitfires from the British. And my first Spitfire shut down in Russia, in southern Russia, in near the Caucasus. Big fight. I shut down and recorded my report, Spitfire. I got a call from the division, are you crazy? Spitfire is in the west. I said, wait till tomorrow. And the next day came 30, 20 Spitfires. You know, the Russians in the south or in Russia, the Russian fleet, air fleet, was one third Anglo-American. Over the next four years, Rawl would fly more than 800 combat missions over France the USSR, and Germany. He would be shot down eight times, and he would become the third highest scoring aerial ace in history. He would destroy 275 enemy aircraft. The feelings are as, as secondary, you know. You do your duty. Hubert Hub Zemke was born March 14, 1914, in Missoula, Montana, the only child of German immigrant parents Anna and Benno Zemke. He grew up in the outdoors, sharing his father's passion for hunting and fishing. 
Hub's mother, Anna, wanted her son to get a college education. Money was tight, so Hubert panned gold to get through college. In his senior year, the first half of his senior year, he was asked by the um, ROTC commander at the University of Montana to see if he could qualify to go to flight school. Three people attempted to go. Uh, Dad was the only one that could pass a physical. Zemke elected to enter the Air Corps cadet program immediately, instead of waiting until after graduation. He had no special knowledge of aviation and no real desire to fly. More than anything, what the Air Corps offered to young Hubert Zemke was the prospect of a steady job in the midst of the Great Depression. Zemke displayed great skill as a pilot. After earning his wings in 1937, he was assigned to the 36th Fighter Squadron at Langley Field, Virginia. He discovered a passion for flying and became a skilled pilot. Commissioned as a second lieutenant, Zemke was assigned to Langley Field in Virginia, flying Curtis P-40 fighters. In 1940, Zemke and his friend and squadron mate, John Allison, were sent to England to observe and analyze the tactics of British and German fighter plane units. Uh, when he arrived in England, the British uh, had agreed to supply the Russians with P-40s. The British had no need for this aircraft. They considered it politely to be inferior to their Hurricane and Spitfire and to diplomatically smooth things over and integrate the Russians into this war, which the Russians were now in. They were to ship 300 P-40s via Murmansk to the Russians. Zemke and Allison spent the second half of 1941 teaching the Russians to fly the P-40s. John Allison had to convince him time and again to not engage German aircraft that he was seeing. And at one time, he said, I came head on with a JU-88 reconnaissance plane coming straight at me, and I was gonna shoot him down. John pleaded with him, Hub, we're not at war with the Germans, so you can't do that. And Dad told John, they aren't gonna know who it is and who did what. And he was unable to catch him. December 7th, 1941. The Japanese attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and brought the United States officially into the war. Zemke wanted desperately to return to the West and join the fight. With Europe cut off by German occupation, Zemke made his way south through the Caucasus to Tehran, then to Cairo, across the South Atlantic, and back to American soil, arriving in February 1942. He was assigned to command the 56th Fighter Group, stationed at Savannah, Georgia, the first fighter group to fly the Republic P-47. He began training the group hard, preparing them for what he knew they would face in combat against the Luftwaffe. Zemke was unimpressed by the P-47, but he analyzed its strengths and weaknesses and began working out tactics that would make it an effective fighting machine. The P-47 could not climb due to its weight, but the P-47 could dive like a sewer bed. This aircraft could outdive anything that the Germans had or that anyone wanted to configure against it. So he used high altitude. Understand the war was being fought at low altitude. They were turning fighters constantly in a turning configuration at somewhere between 10 and 15,000 feet maximum, often quite below that. Here's this guy stacked up at 25,000 feet with the Germans approaching him at 15,000. It was a perfect setup. Well, P-47 was immensely important, uh, not only in quantity, but ultimately in quality. Uh, it was a design that really derived from a 1933 design by Alexander Cartvelli and, and Seversky and a, a, a a Canadian whose name escaped me for the moment. But uh, it was progressively improved. When it rolled out, the original model was troublesome. It didn't have the performance that they wanted, uh, but uh, it was going to be available. The Republic then had the manufacturing capability. We ordered a lot of them. 
And we knew that it was powered by this great engine, this R, uh, Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine that was going to be a, a lead engine in the war. And over time it was uh, improved. It, had, uh, it was improved with a better propeller, improved with a better a turbo supercharger system, improved with uh, a uh, better canopy. Uh, it had uh, external fuel tanks applied to it. Uh, it, and it became a very, very effective weapon. Uh, and you, if you'd like to provoke an argument, just tell a P-47 pilot that the P-51 is a better airplane and, and you'll get a good argument. In 1942, America had no real air force to speak of. And they took these young men, Cochran, Zemke, John Allison, and they put them in strategic positions or positions to command. Here you are, 25, 26, 27 years old, highly spirited, two years of college, three years of college, uh, the cream of the crop physically, mentally, that the Air Force can sort out and we're putting through flying school starting in about 1940, 41, had about 300 hours flying time, cocksure of themselves, egocentric as hell instituting discipline among this group of people, building cohesion, and training them was a first-class task. As an avid outdoorsman and champion collegiate boxer, Zemke had learned self-confidence. He believed deeply in discipline and cohesion, and he drilled into his pilots a philosophy learned in the boxing ring and honed by his observations in England and Russia. Use your wits, size up the opposition, keep hitting him where it hurts, and always keep the initiative. They had no combat experience. Understand, Germany has now been at war, really, since 1936, training pilots in Spain, developing tactics, being led by exceptionally good pilots. Transferred to England, the 56th Fighter Group saw its first combat in April 1943. It was obvious that they had much to learn. Zemke and his squadron leaders developed and refined their tactics, exploiting the strengths of the P-47, its diving speed, firepower, and ruggedness. And Zemke drilled into his fighters the lessons of discipline and unit cohesion. He did not tolerate lone wolves or undisciplined hotshots. The training, the discipline, and the experience quickly began to pay off. By November 1943, Seven months after its first combat mission, the 56th Fighter Group had produced six aces, including Zemke, and it was gaining fame as one of the elite fighter units in the European theater of war. And Hub Zemke was a full colonel at age 29. He had a nature about him that I've watched throughout my life that attracted men to him. And it was more leading from the bottom up, not with a lot of words, but by mannerisms, by things briefly said and done. Very unique man in this way. Robert Rankin was born in 1918 in Washington, D.C the youngest of six children in a close-knit American family. He and his brothers loved hunting and fishing and playing sports. Rankin was a gifted musician, and in March 1941, the Army drafted him and placed him in the Army Air Corps Band, stationed in El Paso, Texas. Uh, we were sleeping in tents. Well, I found myself in 9,500 degree temperature, jumping off the cot at Newtown, running outside and watching these airplanes. They were ferrying in P-38s and P-39s through Biggs Field to Alaska. And they were just barely clearing the tops of our tents because we were a thousand feet above the wind and they peeled off. That got my attention. And I thought to myself, 
how come I'm doing this? <laughs> how does it work? How come I'm jumping there to watch this? Rankin applied for the Army's aviation cadet program and began training in July of 1942. He was one of the few in his class to be chosen to fly fighters. And I was in advanced flying school. My instructor said, we're going to meet at a certain altitude. We're going to do a 180 away from each other, fly for two minutes, and then come back head on and rat race and see who can get on the other's tail. I was a young aviation cadet, but I was in advanced flying school. And all along, I've been told the pilot who has the height advantage has the advantage. So as I was climbing away, when I left, I was climbing the whole time. And I was climbing on the way back. So I had him locked cold. <laughs> I got on his tail. There's no way he'd get away from me. And that's the reason I was selected to be a fighter pilot, because I whipped his butt. <laughs> Rankin checked out in the P-47 Thunderbolt in April 1943 and transferred to England in August of that year. After two months at a replacement depot, Rankin and 10 other replacement pilots joined the 56 fighter group on the same day. First, it impressed me. Uh, I got there at a time when they were getting ready to schedule for a mission. And these pilots are standing around fighting to get their name, hey, Put me on, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. Then, man, these guys, here they are fighting to get on the mission. So um, this got my attention right away. Of that group of 11 pilots, 10 completed their tours and some extensions and went home. Only one was killed in action. If we did what they told us, you had a good chance of surviving that war. And only one pilot, and he was probably one of the best of the 11, they put him immediately flying in Hub Zemke, the group commander's wing. His name was John Roby from Texas. He was an excellent pilot, but we had a place called the Wash off the coast of England. It was a place where you could, it was a big cement block and what have you, where we practiced dive bombing. And it was one of these days where there's no difference between the sky and the water. He dove straight down and just kept going straight in. And that's the only one we lost out of those 11. Flying with the 56th Fighter Group, Shorty Rankin became the first Allied fighter pilot to shoot down five aircraft in a single mission. He would end the war a double ace with 75 missions, 10 aerial victories, and a deep respect for the leader of the 56th. It had to be that way. If you didn't cross cover and take care of each other, the, the game is lost. In 1939, as German troops swept across Poland, Germany and Russia signed a non-aggression pact that secretly divided up Eastern Europe between the two powers. Under a trade agreement signed in 1940, Russia provided Germany with raw materials, especially oil, in exchange for German military and industrial equipment. But German Chancellor Adolf Hitler and Russian leader Joseph Stalin each remained very suspicious of the other's plans. In Germany, even as the trade pact with Stalin was being negotiated, Hitler and his military commanders began planning for an invasion of Russia to seize control of its oil reserves, land, and other resources. Stalin and his generals believed the Germans would invade Russia, but not before mid-1942, and not before Hitler had defeated England. On June 22, 1941, Hitler's armies launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. It was the largest military invasion in history. More than 4.5 million Axis troops swept into the USSR along an 1,800-mile front from Finland to the Black Sea. 
Stalin had been warned of German troops massing on the Soviet borders, but he did not believe the Germans would attack and the Soviets were unprepared. The air battle in Crete ended on May 30th, and Rawls' squadron was sent to Bucharest, Hungary, then to Measle, Romania, near the Ukrainian border, where they received replacements for their BF-109E fighters. The BF-109F, or Fritz, was more aerodynamic than the E model, with a new propeller and spinner, retractable tail wheel, redesigned wing, and cleaner lines overall. The E model's two 20 millimeter wing-mounted cannons were gone, but Rawl believed the Fritz's armament, a single centerline cannon, and two nose-mounted machine guns were enough. A skilled fighter pilot, he said, shouldn't need a battery of weapons. At the Staffel's usually quiet airfield near the sleepy little gypsy village of Miesel, Rawl and his pilots were surprised to see a lot of activity as planes and staff and supplies passed through. I came back from, from Creed Island. This was a lousy battle. We came back to uh, Romania, to Misil, it's a little uh, gypsy village at the foot of the Carpathians. And uh, we were there a couple of days and got new airplane, and the 104, the 109F. And during that time, there was build up and hit forces from the army. I said, what's going on to an officer? You know, we go to Russia. And we were shocked to say, are they crazy? The war is not finished in the West. No, we start a two front war in the Russia. So we were set up, no doubt. But there's not very much thinking. You have put in action and you do your job, Benito. On June 22, 1941, Gunther Rahl and the German Luftwaffe would begin to fly in a new and surprising direction. In support of Operation Barbarossa, the German Reich's undeclared war against the Soviet Union. It began in summer, with 99 German divisions beginning an offensive from the Baltic to the Black Sea. According to Gunther Rahl's autobiography, within a day, the Luftwaffe destroyed 1,817 Soviet aircraft, 1,498 of them on the ground. Following these initial successes and victory at the Battle of Kiev, which began in August, Hitler declared, we have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. In fact, the exuberance of summer would soon give way to the bitter reality of a nightmarish winter of suffering and discontent for Gunther and his fellow flyers. Operation Barbarossa would initiate the largest military confrontation in history and the beginning of the end of the Third Reich. So I went down, bellied in the snow, but the speed was too high, and I jumped up again. Now I was stalling just above this uh, ditch and went down and then the wall came and ah, the big crash and it was out. Then he came to my bed, the doctor. Forget flying, that's out. You broke your back three times. And then I stopped and said, doctor, I will fly again. Zimke's wolf pack was so successful because of Hub Zimke and his leadership and what he instilled in the pilots and made them aggressive to carry on to get the job done.